All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm PJ Norwood with uh, today's uh, Fire Engineering uh, Live uh, Hump Day Hangout for January 26th. We have, uh, as always, we have a great show lined up. We have the uh, the one and only Frank Ritchie, uh, who I share this platform with every month, and we're blessed with Chief Halton's presence. You will see that we have uh, no current guest on the screen. We had a couple last minute cancellations and a couple add ons, but our one of our original guests will be here, Grant Peasley, today. We're extremely excited to talk about who's uh, we've been honored to have him on our show in the past. He'll be uh, logging in shortly and um, we'll bring everybody up to speed on what we're going to speak to uh, Dr. Peasley about today. Um, however, we're going to turn the, sh the beginning of the show over to, to Chief Hall and the, uh, the fire service over the last uh, four weeks or so has been taking a lot of hits, um, a lot of firefighter injuries, a lot of firefighter line of duty deaths, as well as a significant major incident um, in the city of New York, which really taxed uh, FDNY uh, with a significant uh, civilian fatalities. So I know Chief Walton's going to uh, just discuss some of that and just maybe discuss some of the other uh, good things that are going on in the world of the fire service, especially with uh, FDIC and getting back on schedule and on track with FDIC. So, uh, Chief Hall, thank you for joining us today. We're, we're always grateful to have you here, especially with uh, your upcoming schedule today and tomorrow and, and every day of the week. We appreciate you being here with us. Oh, it's a, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have missed this for the world because Dr. Peasley has been um, a true blessing to the fire service. We, we're we're going to, I'm going to speak for a moment about the the hard times and the incredible strife that the fire service has experienced over the last three weeks. Um, but there's always a, a, a tomorrow and a brighter future. And having men like Dr. Peasley uh, give of his time and talent and, and knowledge and skill and ability is clearly one of those blessings that I am so, so deeply grateful for. Um, because without truly men like him, um, we would be far worse off. It's truly, it's truly, I'm truly so grateful uh, to the, to the good professor for, for sharing his time with us, but to the fire services um, grief at the moment. Um, over the last three weeks, we've experienced events that most folks would say are once in a lifetime type events. Um, the loss of four incredibly beautiful and talented men and women um, whose uh, lives are too rich to, in a brief statement like this, touch upon with any element of justice and, and, and what they deserve. So I won't err in that way by leaving out any of the incredible accomplishments and incredible effects and incredible legacies that they've left behind. But I hope that every firefighter listening to this understands that they will never be forgotten. And that although some may measure life in terms of what we accomplish and what we gather and the prominence or the gush coin, as my good friend Eric Roden would call it, that people get, it is not that that measures what a life is. And although we may be summons from this world all too short and all too briefly, a life well lived and a life led with purpose and a life of service to others truly has rewards that those who have chosen a softer path, a milder path, can't comprehend. And although it doesn't assuage our grief at the loss of these incredible people taken too soon, Surely we understand how rich the lives that they led were and how much they left behind that can't be measured. Someone once said that we can measure things that really don't count, but we can't really measure the things that do. When you think of the thousands upon thousands of lives that they impacted, the people that they saved, the people they inspired, the joy they brought into the world, the kindness they showed to total strangers, that's immeasurable. That's a rich life. That's a life that Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Cuban and all the rich guys and gals in the world could never hope to attain, could never match, could never hope to have the, the, the have touched people in such a way because the life of a firefighter is the richest life any person could ever hope to aspire to. We arrive, we ask for nothing in return, and we try to make things better. It's just that simple. And sometimes we pay the ultimate price as our 
friends and fellow colleagues recently have. And sometimes, as our friends in New York, we arrive at a situation that is so involved and so complex and so dynamic that despite our incredible efforts, we lose more folks than we ever could have imagined we would lose. And, and that's tragic. But that shows why we exist. Because although we've lost folks in Philly and we've lost folks in New York recently in numbers that we just cannot stand, we've saved folks. So remember that. The, 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 the point is to carry on, not to forget, not to diminish, not to ignore what we've just experienced, but to carry on, to be stronger. Uh, Proverbs, I believe it's 2717 says, as iron sharpens iron, another man sharpens his friend's countenance. And what that means is that we need to be stronger for the sacrifices that our brothers and sisters have made. We need to be stronger not insensitive, not uncaring, not, we need to be more empathetic. We need to be more concerned. We need to be better every day. And if we don't want to commit to being better every day, we should just go home because firefighters, the men and women in this industry promise to God and one another that we will always be better tomorrow than we were today. And that's the best thing that we can take out of our last few weeks of misery. That's the message, not blame, not retribution, not holding people accountable for things they couldn't control. Love, stronger community, stronger commitment to the mission and being better tomorrow than we were today. So with that, I'd like to take a moment to again say, thank you to our good friend, Dr. Professor Peasley, Thank you so much for sharing your time and, and your energy. Um, I read your paper. I felt like Sling Blade. I didn't understand much of it. <laughs> I understood some of it. Um, it. It was incredible. I think if, if um, Frank and, and, and PJ, uh, just a little bit of history on this, the good doctor has been looking at PFOAs and PFOSs, which are forever chemicals. Uh, they're ubiquitous across society these days. And the doctor says that people have, have researchers have found presence of, of PFOA and PFOSs in the bloodstreams of polar bears. And I don't, I've, I've never seen a polar bear except in the zoo. Um, so I don't know how they got a hold of the uh, hold of them, but that's how prevalent they are in, in society. We do know that they're not good. They're, they're not, they're not a good thing to have in your system. And so we're now finding them in, in places in the American Fire Service, in our, in our firehouses, in our, in, our, in our fire apparatus, in our gear. And, and, and we're trying to figure out ways to minimize those exposures and to know where they're coming from. One of the things that I'm an advocate for, and I'll, I'll say this with no hesitation, I believe that there are European counterparts who have labels on their gear that says specifically what chemicals are in their gear. We ought to have the same we ought to have the same thing in our gear. Now, I don't know what agency or whoever we have to strangle to make that happen, but we ought to start strangling something and, 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 and get that done. Um, because I think it's, it, 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 forewarned is forearmed. Uh, and, and so the studies continue uh, in groundwater contamination. These things have been found. Obviously our friend Rob Beloit, a uh, wonderful movie about him and his, crusade about groundwater contamination, dark waters, please avail yourselves of that. Um, but Rob and, and, the, and the good doctor continue to help us to discover where these chemicals are in our industry. And, and so the good doctor has just released another paper, a peer reviewed, highly technical paper that is not in fire engineering um, because- And probably won't have, be. No, no nor, yeah, nor, nor, would the good doc, nor would the good professor want it to be because it didn't really fit but um, PJ, Frank, if you have any questions for the doctor before the doc begins to explain what that research was about and what it means to us, um, I'll open it to you two guys first before we let the doc go and we pepper him with questions. Well, I know the, the good doctor's time is limited. So I really want to hear about his paper and I want to hear it right from him because that's who our viewers are, are tuning in to see today. So uh, Dr. Sorry for the mix up and thank you so much for coming on at the last minute. We really appreciate it, but your work is critically important to firefighters. Um, you've just heard Bobby so eloquently talk about 
you know, some of the risks that while we try to manage, we can never eliminate. You're helping firefighters understand risks that we may be able to mitigate and manage a lot better in the future. So death is always the card that's in the hand of a firefighter. We hope they never have to play it, but injury and death, you do this job long enough, you're going to get hurt and you could get killed, but your work is so vital to everything that we do. So please, uh, with no further ado, the good doctor, go ahead. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, Bobby. Those are eloquent introductions that I'm not going to, ho hopefully I'll be able to live up to some of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, in a day when we're considering all the larger consequences, it does seem pretty trivial. Um, there's, a, there's a lot online for you guys. And I'd like to thank everybody who listens just for their service because not enough people do that. And I'm not a firefighter. Um, I'm a scientist. Uh, I was dragged into this uh, because somebody sent me some turnout gear and said, hey, I think this has got PFAS in it, which is a series of these chemicals. And uh, as you know, we did a show on this uh, a year ago when we published the paper on, on looking at some new and used turnout gear. And we saw PFAS. We saw a lot of PFAS and it was all over the place. And just said, uh-oh, this doesn't mean that you should stop wearing the gear. This means that, whoa, there's a source of exposure to this chemical on your gear. And the annoying thing, as Bobby correctly pointed out, it's not, you're not told about it. And that's, that's the thing that stings, right? You guys know about risk. You know how to go into a building, building or when not to. Um, how do you know that the pants you're wearing or the, or the jacket you put over has got a chemical in it that you shouldn't be touching? Um, it's fine if it doesn't come off, but if it touches and you come off, then that's not good. And you, you can work with that gear. I mean, it's a personal protective equipment. It should keep you safe in a fire and it does. It's well, it's well engineered that way. Of course, they went overboard and they engineered it with something that was the best water, uh, water proofing agent they had. And unfortunately, that's not a good uh, choice if you have other waterproofing agents that don't cause cancer, that don't induce immunotoxicity that don't attack your thyroid, all sorts of things that these chemicals are known to do. And we don't want to do doom and gloom and say, oh, you're all going to be in danger now, because it isn't that so. It's a statistical game, right? You know that you can inhale some smoke and it doesn't kill you. But if you continuously expose to carcinogenic smoke, you will more likely contract cancer. So the self-contained breathing apparatus came around. Same thing with the gear we will revise the gear such that it doesn't have these chemicals that we know are bad for you, uh, but it takes time and effort. And well, nobody knew it was there. Well, somebody knew it was there, but it doesn't really matter. It, it, it was up at the chemical chain and the chemical companies are adverse to telling you that not to buy their product. So, and it wasn't the firefighter buying the product. It was the manufacturers who bought it from the mill that mill bought it from the chemical companies. So rather than worrying about where it came from, the question is how bad is it? And our first paper observed it was there. And we also made a second observation that it came off. And we talked about that and what does it mean? And we talked about all those implications. Uh, we followed up, well, we, a different lab followed up and said, we want to check this and see if it's really true. And with the help of the IAFF, they actually got hold of new gear. And this, they, they didn't do a silly thing. They, the IAFF went to the best PFAS lab in the world. Jennifer Fields lab in Oregon state is the top lab that studies PFAS and they led the charge already 20 years ago that this was a dangerous chemical and they have probably the best analytical equipment on the planet for this stuff and well-trained students to do it. And they have a lot more funding than me, uh, but it was fun because they went ahead and they were very gracious and I know Jennifer well, and she invited me onto the paper and said, Hey, can you do your analysis again, but for our samples. And so I did my analysis again, and they took those numbers, but it was just one small part of her paper where they had several other experts. They had uh, you know, six other uh, principal scientists working on this. They had graduate students, and they looked at things that I couldn't begin to imagine to look at, or I didn't have the facilities to look at when we began. Um, and there are a couple of takeaways that I'll just sort of try and summarize, and you don't have to read the whole thing. The abstract you can read, it's short, it has a picture, um, but it it's really gets technical in a hurry. And so it wasn't a paper designed for the firefighters, I'm afraid. It was designed for the scientific publication uh, that other scientists would get involved and say, oh, wow, there really are things. Because while Peasley wrote this paper a couple of years ago and said, you know, that this is something the firefighters should work, or look out for, some of the scientists were still skeptical because it was the first single study to have reported this. And they said, well, it can't be that bad, can it? And what this paper does is it validates the earlier research. That's one of the things it wasn't intended to. It was intended to be an independent check of it. But uh, they found in every piece of turnout gear they looked at, the outer layer, the inside moisture barrier, and the thermal liner that, that covers it, all had PFAS and all had PFAS readily identifiable. They looked at even more than I could. And they found 
comparable numbers. They were a little bit lower than my numbers, uh, maybe a factor of two lower in some cases. And that's okay because they looked at all new gear and I looked at some older gear and I think, well, maybe more comes off with time. And they, I also used an extraction that was a little bit more aggressive. I used an oxidant in there, a base, and that brings out a little bit more. But it's like I'm looking at what comes off in a year and they're looking at what comes off in a day. And so there are different amounts, um, but it's, it's, uh, that's the generalization of what happened. I used a little bit of oxidant to get it out. That's a standard technique. And they used a different standard technique of just pure methanol to see what would, what was not attached to the code at all. And uh, I'm, I think that the numbers between the early study and the later study were very comparable. Uh, they're a little bit lower. And so maybe I was a little bit aggressive, but it, it was, if you think about the life of a code, mine is certainly an underestimate. Um, and so it's still got plenty of room. What they did that was different in this paper is that they used completely different methods. They, they used uh, my method, but they used two other methods for total fluorine and they saw the same numbers, which was good. Then they used a different method to measure um, the PFAS. And what they looked for was a class of chemicals that I couldn't look for, which was called volatile PFAS. And these are smaller molecules that are tend to be uh, more volatile means, as you, as you guys well know, uh, means that it's more likely to turn to gas form. Now I'm talking to firefighters, you know what volatile is. Um, and so these, these chemicals, they don't smell because they, they don't have any odor, but these ones are the ones that come off more readily in heat. They're the ones that will boil off, um, but they are also part of the manufacturing process and they're called fluorotelomer alcohols and also sort of fancy names that people have for them. Um, and you can measure them, but with a different instrument than what I used. And so Jennifer Fields Lab has both. And so they ran them through all the instruments they had. <clears throat> they even in, uh, contracted a guy in Japan to look at the polymers. And he did a, 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 even a third technique that nobody in this country does in Japan to analyze what type of polymers we used. And they confirmed what we thought it was there, but they can actually tell you what, what types there. And so that was the work done. Now the scary part. The scary part is when you look at the volatiles, there's a hundred times more of them than there are of the things that we observed in our paper. So for one particular component, there's a hundred times more PFAS than we thought. Um, the other PFAS may be a factor of two lower, but these ones are a factor of a hundred higher. Uh, and that's, that's scary um, because these things, we don't know their impact of all of them, certainly on humans, but uh, if they're volatile, you can inhale them. Um, if they're volatile, they're smaller and they're more likely to go through skin even than the bigger ones. Um, so there are risks associated with these PFAS and they're, they're widely known in the world. These are not unknown things. People are starting to look with the, with this instrument all over the world, but it, it was, um, so sadly what it means is this paper not only saw what we saw before, but it added a whole new dimension to it as well and said, wow, there's a lot more there. And interestingly enough, it was mainly concentrated on the moisture barrier. So what we had concentrated on before the moisture barrier was pure Teflon. And I said, okay, it's Teflon. It's a big polymeric PFAS and there are things in it like these small chain ones that come off and we could see them migrating off. But this, this run study said we can see volatiles and there are a lot of them on that moisture barrier. And that's part of the way that it's made. Um, it's made with these small chain chemicals. I saw some of them, but the, I saw the ones that were the, uh, the less volatile and there's a hundred times more of the volatile ones. What does that mean to the firefighter? Um, it means that, yeah, we should be careful this gear. It's got stuff on it. I don't know what it means in terms of exposure because I haven't done the exposure studies and I, I'm not an exposure scientist. So somebody was going to have to, and now I know several people are. NIOSH is looking at us. And when they see this paper, they're going to return their attention very strictly to the, uh, very directly to these types of things. I know several other groups. I know a group in Alabama that's going to look at this. And I know a group in England that will look at this. And they'll all start looking at, gee, I wonder if these volatiles could get in through skin. I wonder if they could go uh, in the armpit or the neck. And I wonder if they could be inhaled. I'm sure they can be inhaled. I wonder if they come off in high heat. Um, that would be interesting. Um, I, all those things are possible. That would be a source of perfluorinated chemicals that could a firefighter could get exposed to. We know the original source was always AFFF and use of the firefighting foam, but we also observed that many of the firefighters that never used AFFF are also got elevated blood blood levels, uh, blood um, uh, levels of concentration, blood serum levels of, of PFAS. And so... We don't know uh, what it's all related to, but we're worried that the gear might have a factor. Um, it may not be. I'm hoping uh, my sincerest dream at night is that this all goes away and yeah, we're, it was a bit of alarm about nothing. There's nothing there. Uh, the alternate nights when I have those uh, dreadful dreams are what if this is causing cancer amongst the fire services and one of the, one of the ingredients that does certainly not the only one. There's a lot of carcinogenic smoke and you know, the, the residential fires are more toxic than ever. 
but and there's the AFFF, which we're phasing out, but there's still been 20, 30 years of use of it uh, in the municipal fire services. Um, and so, and, and we get it from, of course, the drinking water and, and other products. The, the, the jackets that we wear is a, um, a rain gear in the, in the civilian world. But you guys are getting occupational doses, and until now, nobody knew about it. So again, this paper is going to reemphasize the idea that we treat this gear with respect, that we keep it sequestered from our other laundry, that we keep it, we, we wash it before we wear it, and we keep it sequestered from other use. If you're not actively using it, best to probably hang it up and put it elsewhere. I know it's a pain to put on and off, and there's all sorts of, of policies that the fire services will have to invent as to when they should wear it, when they shouldn't. But it, it clearly keeps you safe in a fire, so we do, you guys do have to keep wearing the gear. Um, but why can't we make gear that's safer and then switch to it? Um, and I'm really pleased how the IFF and the fire services in general have responded to the first paper because there is now alternative gear that's becoming available. It's not widely available. It's only just beginning. The companies are peddling as fast as they can to sort of pivot and say, you know, a short while ago, there was no problem. And now all of a sudden, oh yes, we're fixing it. Um, and all those companies are having to pivot very quickly. And I believe that the outer gear will, will be uh, changed over the course of the next five to 10 years for everyone. Um, that's my sincere hope. Um, and then it's the same gear that you're wearing now. It just doesn't have this chemical involved in this class of chemicals and it will be safer. Um, unfortunately, the moisture barrier still remains um, and the moisture barrier is still uh, uniformly Teflon because of a, a, a various rule in NFPA 1971. And I think that rule may have to be addressed um, because it's, it's there for the wrong reason. And it's not protecting the firefighter. It's, it's, it's not doing any purpose. Um, and so uh, now that we know that there are more PFAS than ever in this, in this Teflon layer, um, that's bad news for the, for the company that wants to keep the Teflon there. Um, <clears throat> and so um, that's the basic upshot of this paper. Um, and it's, it, as I'm sorry, it's so technical. It wasn't my paper to write. It was uh, the people who led the study. I, I was just a co-author on it. Um, and I think that... Um, uh, my contribution to it was to say they wanted to know if my technique gave the same numbers with the same samples. So they basically asked me to reproduce my paper for just for their samples. And I did, it was a single number and I sent it to them and they were happy to compare it. And I guess what, it worked out pretty well. We got the same number, but it was, um, uh, it was an independent study and they led it and they did a much better job than I could have done on the first one. So this gives a lot of weight. There's hundreds, if not thousands of PFAS scientists now around the world who see this as a, a, a gold seal uh, lab that said, yeah, this is an issue. There, there's a lot in there and, and people should be wary of it. They, they didn't go anywhere into the health effects because that's not their job. Uh, they just said, this presents something that needs further study in exposure science. This is something that needs further study. What happens in thermal gradients? What happens if you guys uh, expose these volatiles? Do they come off? Do they continue to? Uh, do they get into it? And there's a lot of um, medical studies that need to be done of, of you know, could this, have, could this go through skin and things like that. So I've rambled on for a bit, Frank, sorry. Um, but that's the, that's the nutshell. Happy to entertain questions if I can. So before we get to some questions, I know uh, Chief Walton and Frank will definitely have some. For those of you that are watching uh, and listening today, this is your first exposure to, uh, to Grant Peasley. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to a conversation I had with uh, Billy Goldfeder when we first started talking about this. And his big concern was that this was going to be attributed to like yelling fire in the movie theater. Yep. And what Graham has done from the beginning, he hasn't done that. Right. He's told us the dangers, but he's also told us that, listen, we don't have a choice. We currently have to wear our gear. Now we're starting to evolve and starting to get some new gear out there. But there are things that you can do today to protect yourself. So don't think that Graham is yelling fire in the movie theater again today. You just bring this information to us so we could figure out how we can continue to do our job safely and effectively while wearing, wearing our gear. And if you go back on fire engineering, there's articles, there's podcasts, there's Google Hangouts of a lot of the information to give you some of the history. So please go back to fireengineering.com and look for some of that stuff. And don't think that we're yelling fire in the, in the movie theater today that yes, this is a problem, but it's not new today. This has been going on for a long time. And Frank, myself, and, and more importantly, Chief Fault has really been looking at the, the last couple of years on how we could protect ourselves but we know that we still need to wear our turnout gear um, and we still need to protect ourselves. So chief or Bob or Frank, go right ahead. I just want to make sure I threw that out there. With all due respect to my good friend, Billy, occasionally there are fires in movie theaters. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so there's that. 
um, you know, and I, and I love the guy, but to me, um, this is, this is very concerning. Um, and, and I don't, I'm not ascribing motive to anybody. We're not looking for a snidely whiplash tying Nell to the tracks for those of you who remember Dudley do right. But what we are saying is that in our business, it's our job to mitigate risk to the best of our ability always. And first and foremost, to protect those that we serve. And so to that point, my first question to the good doctor, uh, the good professor, that doc, are you a PhD as well? I'm a PhD. That's what we are. Yep. I just, I just always, I'm always so reluctant to say that unless you want to put on a glover, rubber glove and ask me to cough. No, nope, you know, nope, I'm just kidding. A, I'm just teasing. It's, a, it's the piled higher and deeper degree. That's one. No, I'm just teasing. Well, in the hard sciences, I love it, but now you, you can get a PhD in basket weaving. It's yep. crazy. So um, I was going to get one in underwater dance theory. So that was mm. my next, my next endeavor. So the, um, t- but to my point, Doc, it's um, that to protect our communities. As I watched dark waters, and I looked at the, you know. I looked at the groundwater contamination, which is a huge issue, really, really important issue. And it's, it's not nearly done. I mean, don't think that, you know, mm. because Hollywood made a movie about it, that it's over. You know, you can't solve every of the world's problems in an hour and 45 minutes. Sometimes it takes longer. And so that issue continues. In, in regards to our gear doc, especially our, uh, our legacy gear, what what are the issues in terms of the disposal of that gear? In other words, routinely we take that gear and um, because it's assigned to individuals, fire departments lose track of it. In other words, you know, Halton retires, he takes his gear with him and off he goes into the sunset on, uh, on his horse, you know, and, and, and you never hear from him again, but that gear goes somewhere, right? Should we be doing a better job of tracking our gear and maintaining it so that it can be disposed of properly if needs be, or potentially repurposed. But should there be more and more efficient tracking in, in your estimation based upon your, your current understanding of, of the, the gear's potential to be a, a problem or contaminate other areas? Yep. And I think this is uh, an excellent question, Bobby, as usual. Um, the issue you have with the wearing the gear is that at part per million levels, some of this may rub off on your skin. And that's a pretty small amount, but you got a lot of skin. And if it goes through there, or if you ingest it accidentally, now it's in your blood. And a part per, part per billion levels in your blood, we know is bad already. So this is, this is a danger of part per million levels. When we throw gear away, and it's either raised up by some municipality and put in landfill, or it's sent to our colleagues in Mexico who use it for another 10 years and then raise it up and put in landfill. Either way, 100% of that chemical is now in the landfill. And we don't incinerate in this country. And so it's all going to go into our drinking water. And that means there's got to be a pound or two of this stuff per jacket or per pants. Um, and there's, I got 1.4 million times two times a couple of pounds each. That's a lot of pounds of chemical that's going to go into our drinking water, maybe 30 years from now. And so we're not looking at what we drink, but maybe it's what our children drink. Doc, um, that, was a, that was a fascinating comment. If you don't mind me stopping you there. Mm-hmm. There's a pound to two pounds of this chemical in the average set of gear? I would bet. It's mostly bound, and again, mostly bound as polymers. So it's mostly plastics bound to the, the textiles that are on there. And uh, rubbing them gets off microfibers and gets off some in your hand. You get part per million levels. But if you dispose of it, eventually it takes 30 years on a, a good polyester and things like that. Or, or these are nylons and polyacrimids and these long, complicated weaves. It, you know that if you put paper into a landfill, they're all gone in 60 days. If you put your turnout gear in there, it'll still be recognizable in five years. And after about 10 or 20 years, then it starts being decayed and you can recognize it as a textile. And after 30 or 40 years, it's gone. That's all, it's all turned back into its base constituents. But those constituents will be PFOA and PFOS and other PFAS of concern. Um, and those don't degrade. Those stay for thousands of years in the environment. And that's why- And before Frank jumps in here, I just want to say again, all of this was done with the best of intentions, that, the, mm-hmm. that these chemicals were put in there because the stuff that we routinely become in contact with, whether it's chemicals, whether it's bloodborne pathogens, whether it's you know, just filth, mm-hmm. um, it, it, the, the, this, this was put in there to protect us from, from other hazards, which still mm-hmm. exist. So to the good doctor's point, what we need to do now is, is find another agent that is not as toxic 
Maybe it's going to be more cumbersome. Maybe it's going to be heavier. Maybe it's going to be whatever. Maybe it'll have to be reapplied from time to time. But we need to find something that's not potentially life-threatening to us and animals and 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 the rest of the world, um, you know, to, to replace it with. So uh, and, again, and, again, sorry, Doc. And I think that's been done. I think uh, for the outer jacket and the pants, um, there are is at least one company I know of, and I think now two that have found something NFPA 1971 compliant. It looks the same. It feels the same. You can argue it fits the same and things like that, but it it all functions much the same, uh, except that it doesn't have these chemicals. Uh, But what we haven't changed is the thermal liner, but the, the, the moisture bear, the uh, moisture bear, I'm sorry, but the, um, the outer liner is, there is a solution and uh, there might be other solutions that are even better in the future. I don't know, but there's certainly room for green chemistry there, but that's been done. um, And it's due to the hard work of these companies that said, okay, I can do that. And they went ahead and did it. Um, and made it meet uh, compliance for safety than FPA standards. Um, but I think there's something to learn. And I don't want to, you know, the environmental aspect of it is one aspect. And that's, I'm an environmental uh, scientist in some sense. So I, I do worry about that. And when we published the paper about food wrappers, um, my concern was that everybody who eats a fast food wrapper tosses it in the trash. In 60 days, you're drinking that 100%, not just the part per million that comes off. And in fact, food wrappers don't have any contact time with my teenagers. They just, they're gone, right? The food's gone. So it doesn't really come off on the food. But not a single person who read that article thought about that. They said, oh my God, my hamburger is poisoning me. And the same thing here. You have to avoid the, uh, the jacket's going to poison me directly. It may not. It may come off at very low levels. You may keep an underlayer on that always takes it away and you never get exposed to it. I don't know. Those are the sort of exposure studies we have to do. But the idea is that you can reduce your risk to it now. And more importantly, there is this long term of when it goes in the landfill, uh, everybody will be drinking it. But that's that's. I don't think that's the immediate concern of why we're trying to get it out of there now. The immediate concern is that you've got uh, skyrocketing, skyrocketing um, cancer rates in the, in the services, and we want to eliminate anything that we can identify that might be causing that. And this may not be the biggest cause. This may just be an incidental one. But uh, either way, we shouldn't get it out of there. Now, just for our listeners, this isn't something you're not going to find a peace fast animal running around on the farm. This is was a man made monster that. Mm-hmm man-made that did not come from nature it wasn't here everybody says that it's a forever chemical because it takes thousands of years to break down if for a firefighter can you explain that like why is that like you know everything seems to break down or go away why doesn't this break down is that something that you know yep it's absolutely and it's to do with the chemistry so the idea of these things are called fluorochemicals is because they contain the molecule fluorine. And fluorine is a very interesting place on the periodic table. It's very light, um, but it is the strongest bond to carbon that's in the whole periodic table. You can take all of 108 elements and bond it to carbon. And the one that bonds strongest is fluorine. And so that carbon fluorine bond is so energetic that you have to put in so much energy to break it that no microbe, no ultraviolet light, no standard sources of energy that we can get would break it apart. And so once you made it chemically in a lab, and they did that in the starting in the 19, I think it was 1930s, they discovered it accidentally, 1940s. Um, DuPont discovered this thing accidentally, and they said, what use is this? And then over the next 20 years, they invented lots of uses for it, because it is almost indestructible. And you can use it as a lubricant that lasts on spaceships that go to Pluto. Um, So that's a great use for it, because it's not here. Um, But when we started putting it into everybody's cooking patterns, and they're like, yeah, probably not the best place for it. And the dark waters will show you, it wasn't the cooking pans that that was we went away from, it was the industrial manufacturer of it that contaminated this poor town in, in West Virginia, that was the source of that one. In this case, we're putting these in a different form. We're putting them onto textiles and and wearing them. And the answer is, eh, not sure that's the best idea. And in some cases, you can clearly say it isn't. Um, The the latest, (laughs) you won't believe this, but the latest uh, thing we're looking right now is that they're putting them into swimsuits. And this is because of the obvious reason. The marketing says you can now go from the swimming pool to the bar without a towel. And that's an essential use of these fluorochemicals in your swimsuit. Um, now that's just how silly the industry can get when they're trying to sell this chemical everywhere. And yeah, your swimsuit dries because it's never, it's water resistant. Now you have a water resistant swimsuit. Um, I think that just pales in comparison. The essentiality of that is zero. You could argue that it's essential to keep firefighters dry. And I think that's true. I think it is because you're going to get water weight if you don't have a, a repellent coat, but do you have to use the world's best repellent and the most long lived one? 
No, second best will also keep you dry. Sheep's wool will keep you dry at some level, right? And so you can use lanolin, you can use uh, silicones, you can use these other things which are not known to be so toxic and therefore are not as dangerous. Um, and when they first made this chemical, nobody thought about toxicity. And it's just, you know, it's after several decades out there that people begin to realize that uh, we've poisoned some people here using this chemical. Gee, I wonder where else we use this chemical. And as uh, Bobby did in his introduction, they're widely used. They're used in all sorts of over 200 different industrial manufacturing processes use this chemical. And there's a, uh, you know, 1400 of them in commercial use. Uh, that's a lot. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, and the reason it lasts so long is that the piece of the molecule that's carbon fluorine there's a sort of a chain of it. That piece is a PFAS and that doesn't break down below C8. The C8 stay the same, C6s stay the same. And once you make them, they stay that way for as long as we can imagine because there's no microbe that will naturally break the bond. It costs more energy. To, it's like eating celery. You use more energy to eat it than you get out of it. And so no organism that lives on what it eats will eat this stuff. And they've been looking for years and they've never found one that eats it. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to dispose of. High temperature incineration will do it, uh, but nobody's got funding to do that yet either, especially for millions and millions of turnout gear. So I think the long-term solution for where to put this is, is going to be a real issue. We're starting with AFFF though first, because that's much more water soluble. The turnout gear doesn't dissolve in water readily. So it does take a while to get out, uh, whereas the, the, the foam will get there now. And so we're, we're working very hard to get the AFFF out and the AR AFFF out. Uh, but the um, the turnout gear is, I think, a personal exposure risk that we need to consider. So, Doc, you mentioned long chain seas. Yep. Which early on in this debate were heralded as the solution mm -hmm. <clears throat> because somebody said, "Well, they're not they're not PFOAs or whatever. You know, they're they're long chain seas." Yep. <clears throat> but that's not the solution, obviously. So, mm -hmm. uh, other than now understanding that and the weight of this material which I thank you again for, you're always, you're always so clarifying and, and giving me another good reason to hate celery, um, which, which I think is important. Um, <laughs> my, my wife's going to kick me in the head. Yep. But, celery tomorrow. Right, right. So how, and I, and I think it's interesting because we, we often talk about um, transferability, right? In other words, things that NASA did, whether it was Velcro or Tang or whatever, how they cross over in other industries, and, and that's critically important, right? It helps move society forward. I think this is one of those events where the fire service, and, and, and I say this, the, the, I, I, I take second place to no one in my admiration for the fire service, and, and I'm, I'm completely unapologetic about it. But we led the charge on incident command. We led the charge on really environmentalism. We've been, firefighters have been environmentalists for, for a long time. We have, we have been at the tip of the spear in, in a lot of, um, I think, I think, uh, world improving deals like this one. And so what the work we're doing right now to my fellow firefighters who are listening, make sure this word gets out there because you don't want your kids wearing swimsuits that are, that are basically shedding forever chemicals that are gonna end up in, your, in the food chain because the lakes and the rivers that you swim in, you fish in and the, and the oceans that you swim in, we fish in and we eat the fish. And, and then it gets into your system. And, you, and, and as much as we want to deny it, we all, get, we all end up with the water in our mouths when we're swimming. And, mm -hmm. and, and there you go, you know, unless you're, you know, unless you're like Frank with the, you know, with the floaties on your arm and stuff and never put your head below the water. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, so, so basically, you know, we're not, the issue is not myopic, right? Don't think this is just a narcissistic thing about firefighters and we're upset about it being in our gear, you know, it, it may be in the, in the, in the, I have a slicker that I love. I'll, I'll bet you it's in that because boy, you can't, you, that thing is as waterproof as it gets I and mean, you can't wash it because it's so dang waterproof. There's no point. Yep. Um, that's, that's a good indication of fluorochemicals. And this is, this is a drop test. If you have a fabric that you suspect, even if it's your children's uh, swimsuit, you can put a drop of water on it. If it's still drop of water in the morning and it didn't bleed in at all overnight, then uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, fluorochemical. Only that can be that, that water repellent. That's, right. So it's, think of all the farmers out there. Think of all the industrial workers that are wearing, you know, garments very similar to ours for, for all kinds of important reasons that, that this research can help move forward. You know, so, you know, I, I think that there's, I don't know, there's a fancy term that the politicians use when they talk about 
why they spend gazillions of dollars to buy toilets for spaceships because it makes our toilets better somehow. But this is, I think, one of those kinds of events, right? Where we're looking at this into this issue, we're we're pushing it out there along with folks like Rob and others, but we're pushing it out there, and it really impacts every every facet of American society. Plus, for me, being an entrepreneur, there's an in, there's an industry for you. There's a there's a reclamation industry. There's a there's a there's a disposal opportunity for some, you know, young smart or old smart character to to, to eliminate the, these products, to incinerate these products, to to yep. take this to take this off the off the table, so to speak. There's a question in the chat of, to that effect, actually, uh, Bobby. There's are there any remediation efforts being considered for long-term environmental pollution? Of course, there's a lot of people trying. Um, it's not easy. Um, there's the best way to to get it. And I'll say this facetiously: is to drink it because then it's in you and not in the environment. And that's unfortunate. We don't have really good ways to filter large volumes of water, uh, but there are people working on it, and there are several clever technologies out there that are being developed, mainly led by the Army or the the Department of Defense, because they have the biggest problem with the AFFF. Um, and they have uh, 2,300 bases that are potentially contaminated with this. And um, my concern is, you know, we, the fire services, have been hit by this from AFFF and AR AFFF for years. And suddenly we realize, oh, we went away from this length of chain to this length of chain, but all of them are bad. And now we realize that every time you use the class B foams, it's now a hazmat incident. Oops, that's that's becoming a, an alarm. And then, well, what about me? I, I worked with the foam for years and and I've got, you know, X number of diseases, ulcerative colitis or cancers that could they be re exposed, related to my exposure to foam? Absolutely, it could be. And people are pulling away from the foam very rapidly now and it's over, our overhaul. But um, I worry about accidental. What if you did a training pit where you tested every six months or every year, you went out and you put out a couple of pallets on fire and you put them out with a the foam just so you could test the, test the extruders and test the, the ratio and uh, try out the new truck and see if it works. Where did that foam go afterwards? That foam went into a pit, typically unlined and typically into shallow groundwater. If you happen to work in a city or a town in the Midwest where you take shallow groundwater for drinking water, guess what we've just done? And that's unfortunately, I know has happened in a couple of cases. I'm sure it's much more widely spread than we think, but there's a direct exposure to PFAS, which is fire service related that you serve the community. Why would you poison your own community? You wouldn't if you had known. Why didn't people know about this? Why didn't people tell, tell us about this before? And that's where, you know, there's, this is where we need to really just be diligent. And I think Bobby's right about the environmental aspects of it, because we all live in the same environment and we want to protect the community we serve in the sense that we don't want to put trash down the sink. You wouldn't take mercury batteries and throw them out anymore. You, you know, you keep them separate and things like that. So now we do the same thing with PFAS and we, we try to get a handle on it. And yes, people are working on us on remediation solutions. Incineration is one of them, but that's expensive. Um, and somebody else asked a comment about the neck area. Well, that would be through the hoods doc. Um, yep. You know, and that's, that's basically our hoods and our, our, what we call storm flaps. Exactly. That we pop up. And, and they're, they're made out of Nomex, and Nomex is not necessarily fluorinated. It can be, but it, the pure Nomex is not. Um, and so it would have to be tested as whether they're actually fluorinating the hood, hoods or not. And a couple I looked at weren't, uh, but that doesn't mean that all of them aren't. Um, somebody may have thought of, oh, I'll make this one even more waterproof, and they may have fluorinated it. So we don't know about the hoods. The reason we mentioned the neck is that the skin is thinner there. And many of you know that you get more absorption through the neck skin, the underarms, and the groin. That's where the skin is thinnest on the body. And so if you have dermal absorption, those would be the three areas that most likely get it. Your forehead is nice and thick, and you're safe to beat it against the wall for a while. But if, uh, if you are wearing a chemical, um, and of course, we spray our chemicals on the underarms, right? Uh, great place for them. But it's, it's one of those things where the sweat pores are larger, and there's, there's more, more transmission of other chemicals. We don't know about PFAS yet. We're testing it in mice right now, and yeah, it goes through mice skin but um those will learn more about that and be able to set numbers on what goes through human skin from that study and then there'll be further studies as people do more of these things and graham from your work um i've had conversations lately with doctors from yale and harvard mm -hmm. you know science seems to be a ladder it's it's one step at a time and while you were looking at the gear now because of your work because of diane you're having yale and harvard doctors and people across the the world now are going to start looking at the blood what's in the blood. And we've also had guests on this show that are involved in a lawsuit where they've done some blood testing and found higher levels compared to say an office worker. So yep. 
they'll be looking at the blood. We've also had a guest on here, a Harvard researcher who taught us about the dust. So yep. there's just so many different components of this that are ongoing. Um, one thing that I, I have to say to any of our listeners is if you are going to get your blood tested, because some individuals are doing that, once your blood is tested, you are starting a legal clock. So just be aware of that. If you get your blood tested, your legal rights may be affected by that. So I'm not going to give legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. I do play one on TV. Um, most of my life, the law has always been my mistress. But you want to make sure that if you're going to get your blood tested, that you do speak to an attorney because you could actually box out um, your legal rights if you were to seek any remedies. And some of the conversations with the Yale's doctors have been fascinated because they were saying that, well, they don't know yet, but they're they want to look into, is there a way after a firefighter or a person has a high level of PFABs in their blood, is there a way to actually detox it? Is there a way to actually get it and lower the levels in the blood? So I think because of your work, because of Diane, because of fire engineering, getting this word out, you're going to see this area of science continue to grow and we're going to learn more information to just briefly mention what PJ was talking about. Cause there was a bunch of detractors who were, who I got phone calls from who were not happy that Graham Peasley was coming on this show. And I said, my, the fan, same my thing fan club. How about that? I said the same thing to everybody. Why don't you listen to what he has to say? <laughs> the answer is always, we need to listen sometimes and look has, look what's coming out of this. So again, I appreciate your courage. I appreciate you really stepping forward because I think we're still on the bottom rungs of this, but you know, the gear, the dust, the blood, I mean, this is going to expand and it seems like we're getting a handle on the phone. Yep. But one thing that bothered firefighters around the country when we're seeing these higher cancer rates is we were like, why is it that firefighters who don't deal with foam and why are we seeing high rates for a smaller department equal to a larger department? It would make more sense that if you're in Detroit or New Haven or LA city, you would have a higher chance, you know, is it just genetics? What's going on? So I think there's so many questions that still need to be answered, but it's because of your work that I think you're on the found you're the, you've laid the foundation for this. And I cannot thank you enough because I think a lot of answers are going to come out and more questions. PJ. Yeah. So I have a question. I know we're, we're pushing that, that clock mm -hmm. on you. You have another meeting you have to get to, uh, but in Connecticut, we have some legislation that have been pushed forward on a foam take back program. And they've collected all this AFFF foam, and now we're going through, and there's uh, money available for departments to flush their pumps and to clean their pumps where this foam was stored. But one of the hurdles is we, we have, are having a, tr uh, a struggle with what is clean enough, yep. because regardless of how many times they flush and clean the pumps, there are still traces. So mm -hmm. do you have an opinion on that, or can you point the, you know, myself and other listeners into a direction on what the goal should be? because we don't seem to be able to get to zero. Yep. And that's a really tough question. And in fact, you're not alone in asking it. Yeah, Connecticut's not alone. There are about, uh, Michigan's already answered it in some sense. They've set limits, as so has a couple other states, but uh, most of the rest of the states haven't even identified what PFAS is yet. And I'm working with the state of Indiana right now to do that with Homeland Security and IDEM to identify what would be a good goal to get the equipment clean to and what do we do with this old stuff? Two big questions. And um, the answer in my mind is very practical. If you can get rid of 99% of it, you've got rid of 99% of your problem. Um, and so, but that's, that would be too high a limit for drinking water. If I were to drink what's in the tank, uh, having only gotten rid of 99%, I'm above drinking water standards. So then you have to dilute it to get rid of it. Um, but I would claim that if you could recycle it and get down to, um, you know, it's percent level to begin with, you get it down to part per million or part per billion level of the residue, then you dilute that, then you're down, you shouldn't drink it still, but it won't be the huge environmental source that if you had undiluted or you know or once diluted uh, AFFF, a single five gallon bucket of that stuff can contaminate an Olympic size 
400 Olympic sized pools. I mean, it is a, <laughs> it is a to drinking water standards. And so you can imagine that's a lot of, of recirculation. You can do something clever, which is to circulate it through an absorbent like graphite, 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 and you keep on circulating it. And then you just spend time and it's not so much volume and it all comes down to a thin layer. You put out a new filter and start all over again. So there are, there are techniques like that, that uh, um, certainly individual states are considering, but there's no, uh, federal effort. There's no Department of Defense has some ideas about it. They've put out a call for a proposal, um, and so but there's very it's sort of patchwork how to do it, um, and there's no easy answer or quick one at this point. Uh, but the uh, good news is I tell all fire departments, it doesn't have to be immediately. The stuff doesn't go away. It's forever chemical. So if you don't incinerate it all right now because you don't have the budget, keep it. It's not going to go anywhere. Just make sure it doesn't get used accidentally or or unfortunately poured down the drain, which some people have done, in which case then it's all out and we're, we've lost it all. Um, so you want to contain it and keep it sequestered and then decide what to do. And, and maybe a new technology will come up. They'll get rid of it faster and quicker. And I know some people are working on that. Graham, before every firefighter in America starts throwing their gear in the fire bonfire outside, when you say incinerate, you're not just talking about throwing it in a fire. Yeah, I agree. Fire. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I used the wrong word with the firefighters, didn't I? Yeah. It's the new modern high temperature incinerators that go up to about 1,000 or 1,100 degrees. And those will take care of a forever chemical. But that's it breaks it down to inorganic fluoride, which is safe. Um, and so that would work. And we know that the ones in Europe are high temperature enough to do that. We know the new ones in America are high temperature enough to do that, but there, there are very few of them that are municipal. We, we call them hazardous waste disposal sites. And there are a few in the US that have high temperature and are well-regulated and that can work. But of course, if it's an older one that was just turning on at the time, wasn't quite up to temperature, maybe that's worse. Maybe you're spreading it then. Uh, so you have, to, you have to look at the utility that runs these things. And, and yeah, it's like, how do you want your nuclear power? Do you want a good utility or a, a B-class utility running it? You'd like to have people disposing of this stuff, which is good. And so, so eventually the gear, instead of the razor blades or sending it to Mexico, you could possibly see the gear be collected if we can't get it out of the gear, which is hopefully the goal would be to get it right out of the gear. Yep. And it would be fall. nice to do, would be nice to do with some sort of policy like that, but it's, it's, nobody's got money for it. So it's, you're going to have to get creative on how to store this stuff. It wasn't going to go anywhere. I mean, you could collect it and store it. And then when somebody has it, we could put a, a contract together to have somebody say, what do you do with a million sets of turnout gear? And, and think about how that's done. And that would be the cheapest way to do it um, because we it wouldn't have to solve it today. Uh, that might be a, a practical suggestion. I hadn't thought of that, but that, but where do you s store a million pairs of turnout gear um, where the kids don't play in it? Um, that would be, uh, it's, there, are, there are bigger questions like that. Uh, there's lots of questions but, here. But if, those, are, th mm -hmm. those are not hard, qu they're, they're hard questions, mm -hmm. but that's what the fire service is about. We're, we're not about the easy life. We're not about the soft, life. We're strong people who take on hard problems because that's what we chose to do. Mm -hmm. And and in that regard, I hope someone listening to this says, no, I'll, I'll tackle that. It, it, go for it. You know, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I, know, I, know, I know there were guys up in uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard that were actually out there thinking of a company that they could make to get rid of the foam and things like that. And it's, it's perfectly uh, practical solutions are going to be leading the way. I, I will Free market uh, and solve it. Yeah, I will offer for those people sending comments and the qu questions in the comments. I'll be happy to answer them by email afterwards. I've got to run to a meeting, so I'm going to leave you guys soon. But I have to, uh, and it's, an, it's a far worse meeting than this one. Um, and so I will, uh, happy to answer those by email. If Peter or somebody could send those to me I, I, and send me a, a way to send it back. We can, I'll, I'll we, we can do that for you, Doc. And, mm -hmm. and, and Camden, uh, Camden does ask an interesting question. I think what the doc said earlier is that there are folks uh, like Dr. Burgess and some others who are looking at the functions of heat and other uh, other environmental conditions of firefighter space. And if that makes the, uh, our, our bodies more susceptible to the transmission or the transmissibility of these chemicals into our bloodstreams. So that that is being investigated. And our my good friend, my dear friend, Bill Carey, who's who's out there. Um, uh, God, God bless you, Billy, for all you do for all of us. He is asking about future legislation um, where they will have to list uh, their, their, the, the products in the bunker gears we spoke about earlier, um, much less nutrition uh, labels. Uh, and, and Bill, we, we are with you 100% on that. I think that's something that the IAFF, the IAFC, the, the NVFC, the, the 
EIEIO, everybody ought to be right. They all ought to be looking at that and, and, and working towards making that a reality. It's not a, it's not a difficult thing to do. And it would be, I, I think it'd be a good thing to do. I think it'd be a wonderful thing to do. An informed consumer is a better consumer and all manufacturers ought to want informed consumers as their clients. So, so uh, in my opinion, so uh, doc, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to let you go unless PJ or Frank have a pressing question. Nope, Again, the, only thing I, the only thing I want to add to is let them know all of these questions that are in the chat, Graham, are all on the live Facebook feed. So you could answer them okay. directly there. Okay. That would be good. Um, uh, send me a link to that and uh, it won't be till tonight, but I'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Very much for your time. Yeah, no, thank you. And again, to, to everybody in the audience, uh, you know, uh, the, the, good, the good professor, the good doctor gives up his time freely. He's not making a dime off of this. Um, yeah, but Bobby, you haven't sent the check in a long time. No, I haven't sent the check yeah. in a long time. None of my friends get checks. Yeah, how about so, that? <laughs> that's a habit of mine. Um, but the, 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 so, so thank you again. Thank you for your time and your energy and your effort. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. And, and uh, if anybody's got a problem with that, give me a call. <laughs> I'll, be ha I'll be happy to be your complaint department. Thank you guys for all your service. And Thank you. I will chat really with again. Take Thank care, you, Doc. Bye. Hey, to everybody out there, uh, FDIC is coming up. Classes are filling up fast. Registration is open. We'll be opening up our new GemsCon registration pretty soon. We're going to have a track that of a, 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 a sessions at FDIC that are going to be uh, CAPSI accredited, which means that you can get EMS credit for them, being taught by some of the finest doctors and medical people across the country. We're going to have several of them, including five hot classes, which include a moulage class, a water rescue class, a, a difficult intubation class, being taught by some brilliant people that we're bringing in. Um, so it, it'd be a lot of fun. And most of them are firefighter paramedics out in the real world. Uh, as a matter of fact, our medical director, who you'll get to meet at the GEMS Games, which is just an amazing competition on Friday morning. We're going to have teams competing against each other in the, on the big stage in, in like, a, like a theatrical presentation, like a movie. It's like a movie set where they go through, four teams will go through it and you'll, well, the three finalists, but a, a demo team and then the three finalists and you'll get to see this incredible um, uh, mocked up disaster that they have to respond to. And then the team gets to win as the GEMS team uh, winner for the year. You'll get to see that, but it's really cool. But our medical director, who's just the coolest guy in the world, um, he'll, he'll be up there, uh, Ed, uh, Dr. Ed Dickinson. And uh, the, good, the good doc, is a, he's a, fire, a line firefighter paramedic still, where he started from. He's still, he's still out there on the street, but he's also a professor at, at the University of Pittsburgh's uh, medical school and, and an ER doc. And so he's truly, uh, you know, a firefighter's firefighter uh, first, and then a, a, a doc and all the rest of that good stuff, uh, you know, later down the line, because that's where the big money comes from for him, I guess. But I don't think those guys make big money either. But he's truly an amazing character. Uh, you'll, you'll get to hear him speak and talk and, and uh, his life experiences and, and, and his insight into our industry is just amazing, just, just bloody amazing. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think it's, I think it's long overdue. Um, you know, Ed Croker said it best, our, our finest moments comes when we save the handiwork of God himself, human life. And, and he was right when he said that back in, I believe, 1902. Um, and he's right today. So ancient wisdom stands the test of time. Um, Joe Rogan notwithstanding, I don't pay a lot of attention to modern day wisdom. Um, but, uh, uh, old, old Joe, I seem to have a soft spot for. Um, that being said, Neil Young wants to take him off the air. So we're, we're, we're yeah, I'm with, I'm with Alabama. Now. I'm with Alabama as far as Neil Young's concerned. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Good luck, Neil. Yeah. Ha, ha, have a nice day. Um, so, so <laughs> I'm more a cross Canadian ragweed guy than Neil Young, but, but that's another story for another day. Um, so please register, uh, get, your, get, your, get your stuff in there. If you're, if you're a paramedic in a fire department and, you, and you've got four other paramedics and you, and, you, and you think you're really good, sign up. Come the first, We're only taking 15 teams. You got to give us a hundred bucks. We're going to give it back to you to register. Um, you'll, you'll be able to attend classes because the prelims are going to be on Tuesday. So you can take hot stuff and all on Monday. The prelims are on Tuesday. The final comp is on Friday morning. So you can still attend classes Wednesday, Thursday. You know, you can still go to all the exhibits and see all that good stuff. It won't chew up all your time, but you can compete. And, and then you can have bragging rights. You might end up being the, the best firefighter paramedic team in the country. So we'd, we'd love to see you come out and compete. It's really great. The guy who runs it's a, a fire chief named Chris Brainerd, just a hard charging, 
35, 45 year fire chief. The guy is just amazing. He runs the show. So really can't wait to see you there. I know PJ and Frank are both teaching. Sometimes people slip under the cracks. What can I say? But um, just kidding. So, so please come so register for FDIC. I can't wait to see you all. It's great that we're returning back to normal. Um, we'll, 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 we'll be there in Indianapolis on, on the 25th. And I hope you are too. So thank you to PJ and Frank again for allowing me on here. I hope you're all safe. Look forward to seeing everybody in North Carolina. I'll be in Charlotte this evening. We'll be opening up the North Carolina Fire Chiefs. Uh, we'll, we'll be blowing the doors off there. My good friend, Royal Mortensen and I will be uh, kicking off the show for him tomorrow morning. And I hope to see as many of you as I can out there. Um, I hope everybody's safe. I, again, our hearts are breaking uh, for the law enforcement officers who've been killed recently and shot, for the firefighters who've lost their lives in line of duty, for the firefighters who are struggling, um, that, that have been severely injured. We've got uh, uh, two guys that I know of right now who, who need our thoughts and prayers. Um, and, and if there's anything that we can do for any of those families, that we're not doing, please let me know. And, and we'll fire engineering myself will do what, whatever we can. So um, we're, we're praying, we're praying for their recovery. We're praying for all the families that have been so devastated by all of this in the last month. Um, I don't think there's anything left to say. We, we love you and God bless. God bless. Bobby, have a safe flight. PJ, thank you very much. And that's it for today's show and we will see you next month. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Have a good day.